In the first week, we talked about what psychology is, and I have, I have introduced to you that in the in human history, the reason why people want to study psychology is because we are all curious about human behavior, and in the history of human beings, people have been using different methods to study human behavior. Okay, some people they use astrology, star signs. Some people they use crystal balls, and some people they use phrenology. Okay, if you forget what phrenology is, phrenology is a technique where you just use the shape of the skull to predict human behavior. And what is psychology? Why is psychology different, and how is it different from other methods? The contemporary psychology. The way we study human behavior is through scientific methods, and what is the scientific method? First, you need to form a hypothesis first, and then you have to test your hypothesis. And how how do we test the hypothesis? We could use an experiment, or we could use a correlational method. And what is an experiment? A very important feature about an experiment is you need to manipulate. The independent、uh, factor and to observe the dependent factor, independent variable and dependent variable, and according to the examples that we use for the past two weeks, if you want to study the relationship between violent TV shows and aggressive behavior, in this hypothesis, the independent variable is the violent TV shows, and the dependent variable is the aggressive behavior, and to manipulate the independent. Uh, the independent variable. You have to control, or you have to change people's TV watching behavior. This is an experiment.、Okay. And also, in some in some of the cases, you can't use an experiment. So, you have to do the second best strategy, which is a correlational method. But in either correlational method or an experiment. A very important thing about a scientific study of psychology is you have to quantify whatever you want to measure. You have to eventually you have to get the quanti quantitative. You have get you have to get the numbers.、Okay. But so that's why people use that st、uh, statistics.、Okay. But even after statistics, eventually after you have collected the data, you still have to use. Verbal. You have to. You still have to verbalize your statistical result. Eventually, you still have to draw a conclusion. In this conclusion, it's not statistics. You have to explain the mechanism. So that's why we have to use logic to explain our statistical result. And that's also why we introduced some logical fallacies last week. Okay. So in the past two weeks, we have covered the methodology in psychology.、Okay. From this week onward, we are going to shift to the contents of psychology.、Okay. This week is actually the first week we are talking about the contents of psychology. We are going to starting. We are going to start from the basic, the most basic part. Of psychology, which is your nervous system. So this is how things begin. Psychology, we are looking at human behavior, and this is something we can't deny that in any of human behavior there is a physiological basis. If you don't, you need the brain to have a behavior. If you don't have the brain, of course you wouldn't have any behavior. So, for psychologists and for neuroscientists nowadays, none of us, probably most of us, wouldn't deny that in every human behavior there is a physiolo physiological basis. Because you need a brain to do a behavior. If you don't have a brain, you wouldn't have any behavior at all. So, brain is important. And today, we're going to spend quite a lot of time on brain. 
For this connection, the relationship between your brain and your behavior, this connection is easier, relatively easier to solve. The relationship, particularly nowadays, we have a lot of techniques, and we're going to introduce some of the techniques later. We have a lot of techniques which can help us understand the relationship between the brain and the behavior. So this connection is relatively easier to understand. But this is not the whole picture. Because we still don't know behind the nervous system, behind the neural activities, what is the cause of those neural activities. It could be the genes, of course. You need the genes to implement, to to implement, to make up a nervous system. So genes are important, of course. You need the genes to tell your body how to come up with the nervous system. But genes are not the whole story as well. The environment could play an important role. The environment could somehow change your nervous system. It doesn't sound very straightforward how, why an environment can change your nervous system. A very extreme example is if you, okay, most of us, we are visually normal. We can see things because our visual system is normal. The information of our visual system s will be sent to our visual cortex, which is on the back of our brain. But think about some people who are congenital blind who have never exposed to any light since they were born. Because they are blind, so of course their brain wouldn't receive any information from the eye. So their visual cortex basically doesn't process visual information. And what does their visual cortex do? Some, in some of the cases, their visual cortex would process auditory information. In that case, we, that is an example where the environment, because you have, you have never been exposed to light, your brain, your visual cortex somehow is changed. They are processing auditory information now. So in that case, th th that is just an extreme case where environment can change your uh, nervous system. So of course, environment is important. Environment can somehow change your uh, nervous system. In some of the other mild, milder cases, like you guys, when you're sitting here learning something new, there is some change in your brain as well. So learning is also an, an example where the environment is changing your nervous system. Okay. So genes somehow govern your nervous system. Environment is somehow modifies your nervous system as well. Okay. In addition to genes and environment, an interesting question is, is there something else? Is there something other than genes, something other than environment? It could be something we call free will. What is free will? When people are talking about free will, usually free will is something that is irrelevant to the genes, supposedly. If, if you think about a behavior could be affected by the genes, you wouldn't say it is from the free will. If it is a free will, it shouldn't be affected by the genes. Okay. What about environment? Probably it's not environment as well. If something could be predicted, if something could be changed by the environment, if I put you in an environment and you will behave in some way, probably that thing is not free will as well. So free will is free will it should be something other than genes, something other than environment. Okay. And no one knows whether it exists. Free will, some people might use a different name to call the free will. Probably you can understand free will is some, uh, something like soul. Do people, do we have soul, do souls exist? No one knows. If, if souls exist, supposedly, it should be something irrelevant to genes. It shouldn't be affected by the genes. It shouldn't be something affected by the environment. It should be something independent from either of the two. So this is free will, and no one knows whether it exists. So this, that is why 
this connection, genes, environment, or free will, no one knows whether it exists. How do those, how do those things affect our nervous system? This connection is relatively harder to solve. Because it is, it is hard. So, that's, so today, we're going to only be focusing on this connection, which is the connection between your nervous system and the behavior. So today, we're going to use a lot of biological knowledge. Okay. Probably for the whole semester, this week will be the week that we use the most biology. Okay. So how did we come to realize that human behavior has its physiological basis? How did people realize that there is a connection between your brain and your behavior? then we have to trace back to this very important case. This guy, whose name is Phineas Gage, okay. he was a, an American railway worker. Okay. Unfortunately, there was one explosion, because when you are building a railway, sometimes you have, have to use some explosions, maybe to build a tunnel or something. During one explosion act, Unfortunately, there was an iron, iron rod, this one, penetrated his skull from the left cheek to the top of the head. Fortunately, he survived. Okay. Although it, it, it does sound quite scary. Okay. There is su such a big thing penetrate your head. But he survived. Although he survived, something changed. According to his physician, Harlow, okay, this is not a scientific study. This is just from a single case report. According to his general phys uh, physician, before the injury, Gage was a very smart and very nice person. He was a good boy before. He, he, he was a work, hard-working person. He was a sh shrewd, smart businessman, very energetic and persistent. But after the injury, something changed. He became impatient of advice when it conflicts with his desire. He just followed whatever he wanted to do. Okay. He couldn't control himself. According to this change, Harlow, this physician, he sort of drew a conclusion that this part of the brain, the frontal part of the brain, has something to do with your self-control. Remember, this was just a single case report. It wasn't a scientific study. But recent studies, because nowadays we have more techniques to study the relationship between the brain and the behavior, Recent studies actually support this kind of assertion that your frontal part of the brain has something to do with your self-control. Okay. Actually, in, in our brain, there is a tendency that the back part of your brain is, has something to do with more primitive human behavior, like your perception, your sensation. Okay. And as the location of the brain, the brain goes to the front, goes to the front. The frontal part of your brain has something to do with more high-level mental functions, like self-control. Your frontal part, according to recent studies, yes, our frontal part is related to our self-control or personality. And in this case, yes, for Gage, his frontal parts got injured. That's why his self-control ability became changed. Okay. This was just one of the examples that people realized that there is a connection between your brain and behavior. This was another important case. This, this guy, Paul Broca, he was also a physician. He was a French. And he had a very famous patient whose name was this T-A-N. It's not because it, it was, he was French. Of course, his patient was also French. In French, this is pronounced as Don. This patient Don, 
was famous. Why was he famous? Because the reason why he was called Dong was this Dong was the only syllable he could pronounce. He got something wrong with language. He couldn't speak properly. He could also use the word Dong. That's why he was called Dong. But interestingly, although he couldn't speak properly, but he could understand language. So that's why Broca, this physician Paul Broca, he sort of proposed a theory that Dong's injury, which is at the frontal, left frontal part of the brain, okay, left frontal portion of the brain, its process is something to do with language production. And that that area has been called the Broca's area. So Broca's area, you can easily find this term, Broca's area, in all of the psychology textbooks or in linguistics textbooks. When people are talking about the brain and the language, of course you will see this term, Broca's area, which is at the frontal, left frontal portion of your brain. And that is really relevant to language production. Okay. It is not relevant, it is not language understand, it's, it is not language understanding, but language production. That area is called Broca's area. But these cases, Broca or Phineas Cage, these were just scattered cases. They were not scientific study. The reason why there weren't any scientific study on the connection between brain behavior because is because you can imagine that back in the 19th, 18th century, we, like, people didn't have tech enough technique to study the brain. But today, things are different. Today, in the 21st century, yes, we do have a lot of equipments. We do have a lot of techniques which can help us understand the relationship between brain and behavior. And I'm going to introduce three of them. Okay. There are a lot of different techniques. These are just three of them. The most commonly used techniques. The first one, this is really hard to pronounce. Electroencephalogram. Okay. We just say EEG to make it shorter, to make it easier. Just call it EEG. What is EEG? Here is a Wikipedia page. You don't have to really understand the details of the technique, but I just want to show you how the data look like. These are the data of EEG. There are a lot of complex curves here. Every single curve indicate the brain wave change of a, of a specific part of your brain. So if for EEG studies, this is how people look when they are doing the EEG study. There are a lot of electrodes on their scalp. And each electrode is measuring the brain electronical activities of that location. And the data will be look will be like this. Each curve represents each electrode. Okay. For example, it could be the frontal part, it could be the back of your brain, it could be the lateral part of your brain. Each curve represents a particular location of your head. Okay. The assumption is whenever there is something somewhere, when there is, when, whenever there is some activity in your brain, that area will will have some electronical change. And for this technique, it is actually capturing the elect electrical change of that region. Okay. So this is EEG. Actually, it is something that measures your brain wave. What, what about this ERP? Event-related potential. 
it is actually very similar to EE Gene. The only thing different is for ERP, you need an event. What is an event? For example, if you want to study the relationship between language and brain, just an example, and so you play a passage to your participant. So when you hit the play button, the subject will hear some verbal stimulus. Okay. And you are recording his brain activities after he hears the sound. So for in this case, you give the subjects, you give the research participants some stimuli. It could be visual, it could be auditory. That stimuli, that stimulus is an event. You are recording the brain activity after an event, after a stimulus. That kind of technique is ERP. But basically, ERP is also one form of EEG. The only thing different is in ERP experiments, you actually present some particular event. It could be a visual stimulus. It could be an auditory stimulus. It could be a linguistic stimulus. But basically, both of the two techniques are measuring your brain activities, your brain wave change. Here, it has high temporal resolution, low spatial resolution. What does it mean? Okay. The low spatial resolution part is, if you want to know where that brain wave change takes place, for EEG or ERP, it's relatively harder. Why is it harder? The reason is, for EEG or ERP, you are actually att attaching the electrodes on the top of your head. You can imagine there is a distance between the top of your head and the brain. So if you want to know the exact location a particular event takes place, it is not very precise. So that's why it has lower spatial resolution. If you want to know where exactly is, is something is happening, if you want to know the location, then it may not be very precise. But it has high temporal resolution. Why does it have high temporal resolution? Because whenever there is some activities in your brain, you can detect it right away. Okay. For example, if you are a linguistic researcher, and if you want to know when a particular process happens, for example, when do we start to understand the language? Okay. It could be 30 milliseconds. One millisecond indicates 1,000, one over 1,000 seconds. You can measure the brain activity very quickly after the event. So that's why it has very high temporal resolution. Okay. This is just one of techniques, EEG or ERP. Another technique, functional magnetic resonance imaging, or sometimes we just call it functional MRI, is a technique where you want to know where a particular process takes place in your brain. If you, if you want to have higher temporal resolution, spatial resolution, then probably you have to use this one, functional MRI. And what is functional MRI? Here is a YouTube video. So this is the machine of functional MRI. Basically, it is a big tube, and you are just lying in the tube. And that tube will scan your brain. And this is very typical data you will see from a functional MRI study. You will see something bright in a particular part of your brain. And what does this brightness mean? The basic assumption of a functional MRI study is that when a particular part of your brain is activated, it needs blood. Because to, a treat, to activate a neuron, you need nutrition. So that's why you need more blood supply. And functional MRI machine is actually measuring the blood supply instead of neural activities. Okay. This is quite important. Functional MRI machine is actually measuring the blood 
not the neural activity. And the, the assumption is whenever your neuron is activated, it, ne it needs nutrition, it needs blood. Okay. To be more precise, it is actually measuring your level of oxygenated hemoglobin. Okay. Because your neurons need oxygen to be activated. You just have to remember that actually that machine is measuring the blood supply, not the neural activity. And another thing you have to keep in mind is although functional MRI, it looks quite fancy and it is indeed fancy. It is indeed expensive. But sometimes the research based on a functional M MRI may not be very, I mean, the result may not be very solid. The reason is, let's just take an example of this violent TV shows and aggressive behavior. Okay? If you are a researcher, you are a neuroscientist, and you have a, you have a hypothesis where your right brain is the cause of your aggressive behavior. Just it's just an example. Okay, this is your hypothesis. Why are some people more aggressive? Some other people, they are less aggressive. Probably because they have different activities in their right brain. This is your hypothesis. And you have this functional MRI machine and you want to test this hypothesis. Okay. Supposedly, you have to do an experiment. So this is the cause and this is the effect. And you have to manipulate the cost to see the effect. So you have to manipulate the right brain. So supposedly, supposedly, ideally, you need two groups. Okay? One group, experiment, uh, experimental group, those people, they got their right brain damaged. In neuroscience, we use lesion. Actually, it means that you damage that their right brain. Okay, this is so. Usually, we use lesion. They have right brain lesion, and you have a control group. Their right brain, for example, it could be they just have normal right brain, right brain intact which means that it, they don't have any damage, they don't have any injury on their right brain, and you are observing their aggressive behavior. Suppose you, this is what you have to do if you want to do an experiment. But even with a functional MI machine, this, you can't do this. You can't really damage someone's right brain. It's unethical. So what could you do? Because they can, you can't do this with functional MRI. What you do with the functional MRI is you are manipulating the effect. You also have two groups, control groups and experiment, experimental group. But they are on this variable is instead of this variable. You have this experimental group and you have this control group. And what you are doing is, for the experimental group, probably you induce their aggressive behavior. How do you induce their aggressive behavior? Probably you just say something they don't like, okay? Trying to irritate them. This is one of the methods you could potentially use. And for control group, you just do nothing. And then you are observing their right brain 
activity. This is something important about functional MRI studies. Typically, in a functional MRI study, of course, nowadays, there are some more advanced techniques, but for traditional studies, traditionally, when people are using functional MRI studies, they are actually manipulating the effect and to look at the effect of this cause. So the causal relationship for a functional MRI study is actually not as strong as a real experiment. So usually, even, even you have found that for right brain activities, the aggressive group, you have you find higher, you found higher right brain uh, activities. And for control group, you found lower right brain activity. You still can't really say that the right brain is the origin of the aggressive behavior. You could only say the right brain is the neuro correlate of aggressive behavior. Okay, so from the word here, correlate, it somehow implies that it is not the cost, it is not the origin, it is just relevant to aggressive behavior, but not the origin of aggressive behavior. Okay. This is functional MRI. But sometimes, sometimes, you really want to know the origin of a certain behavior. What could you do? You, nowadays, we can use the third method. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, or sometime, sometimes we just call it TMAs. You can use TMAs. And what is TMAs? TMAs, it can create reversible and temporary lesions. What is lesion? Okay. Uh, lesion, you can understand lesion as something like damage or injury. You can cause reversible injury in your brain. How do you cause an injury? TMS, it can generate a magnetic field, a strong magnetic field, and that magnetism can somehow damage your brain. This is something doable, and according to our studies so far, it is reversible, it's not permanent. So people have been using TMS a lot. Okay. Probably it, it will be easier if I can find a TMS web page and you can understand how it works more easily. Okay, Wikipedia. It looks like this. It actually doesn't look too fancy. It's just a coil. And you, you just put it on, on the top of your head and, you, and then you just switch the power on. And then it will generate some... Uh, Magnet magnetic field, and that magnetism can somehow change your brain activity. So if you can do a real experiment with the TMS machine. You can create a temporary damage on your brain. So in this, in this example, if you want to know the relationship between your right brain and an aggressive behavior, you can really use TMS to damage your right brain and to see how people change in their aggressive behavior. This is doable. But the thing is, because you can only apply TMS from the outside of your body, <laughs> so its strength is limited. You can only study the surface of your brain. If you're interested is in the deep part of your brain. No, TMS can't reach that far. Okay. It has a limitation. It can only be used on the surface part of the brain. Okay. But sometimes people really want to look at something deeper inside of brain, then you can't use it with DMS. So these are three most commonly used 
techniques nowadays. EEG or ERP, functional MRI and TMS. And remember, if you really want to know the causation, if you want to really study whether a particular part of your brain is uh, the origin of particular behavior or not, which method should you use? Okay, we actually have talked about this like minutes ago. So, those were methods that we used to study the human brain. Next, because we are talking about the nervous system, so we can't avoid having to learn some dry facts. So let's go back to high school biology again. Okay. Our nervous system could be somehow separate into two parts. The first one is central nervous system, and the second one is peripheral nervous system. Our central nervous system comprises the brain and the spinal cord. And our peripheral nervous system comprises everything other than your central si nervous system. And we can s even separate the s peripheral nervous system into the two parts, somatic nervous system and autonomic nervous system. Somatic. Somatic means something to do with your body. So those neurons, those nervous systems in your body is part of your somatic system. When we are talking about the somatic nervous system, we are talking about those nervous system that we can control voluntarily. For example, I want there is a coffee cup here, and I want to lift up this coffee, coffee cup. I can control this action of lifting up a coffee cup voluntarily. That is controlled by the somatic nervous system. But in our body, there is something that just can't be controlled vol voluntarily, like how you breathe. Okay, for breathing, probably you can hold your breath temporarily, but you can't hold your, hold your breath for like 10 minutes because you will die. So like breathing or, you are, or your, the dilation of your um, pupil, there are something that you, you just can't control voluntarily. You can't control consciously. Because those things are something vital to your survival. Those activities are controlled by this one, autonomic nervous system. By definition, autonomic means they are autonomic. <laughs> you can't control them. Like your breathing, okay? like your di the dilation of your pupils, or your blood pressure. They have, to, they have to be controlled by a system which can't be voluntarily controlled. And for our autonomic nervous system, you can further divide them into two divisions, sympathetic and parasympathetic division. Okay. Sympathetic, parasympathetic, full jiao gan. And what's the dif difference between them? When you are talking about sympathetic, anything that makes you nervous is controlled by the sympathetic division. Anything that makes you relaxed is controlled by the parasympathetic division. For example, you can imagine that in the far past, when we were just you know, hunting and gathering, we have to be cautious about those potential predators, like lions or tigers. You can imagine that when you are facing a tiger or a lion, you, of course, the, the, the first thing you have to do is to run. And to run, you need, actually, you need muscle strength to run. So your muscles need more blood supply. So that's why you have to increase your blood pressure. You have to increase your breathing. All those things are trying to make you survive. And those things are controlled by the sympathetic division. The, the purpose of your sympathetic di uh, division is when you are facing a danger, you have to react to them quickly. Okay. Usually those reactions are something that makes you nervous. And they are controlled by the sympathetic division. Okay. But you can imagine that 
when you are nervous, when your blood type, when you, when your blood pressure is heightened, you actually need nutrition. It consumes more nutrition. So that's why when you, there is no danger, your body has to preserve the energy. And that, those actions, for example, to slow down your blood pressure, to slow down your breathing, those activities were controlled by your parasympathetic division. Okay. The, the, the purpose of the parasympathetic division is, is to conserve energy when there is no danger, when there is no immediate danger. So you need the two divisions to collaborate properly for you to survive. So this is just a brief um, picture of your nervous system. But this course is psychology. When we are talking about psychology, we are focusing on the brain. We don't talk much about the autonomic nervous system. We don't talk much about your spinal cord either. We will be focusing on the brain for the rest of the semester. For our brain, when we are using the word brain, it actually comprises many different substructures. Okay? The brain is actually a very complex, complex structure. Here is just one way to divide your brain into the three layers, Try, trying to make you understand the brain like, more easily. And actually, the brain is much more complex than the three structure. The reason why I just use the three, uh, three layers just, is just to make you uh, to understand more quickly. You can understand the brain in terms of the three structures. The most basic structure, which is your brainstem. The location of your brainstem is at the base of your brain, at the lowest portion of your brain. It controls your anything to do with your survival. Like your breathing or, or your body temperature. It also has another it also has a a nickname. The nickname of the brainstem is the reptilian brain. The reason why it is called the reptilian brain is this part of the brain actually it, it emerges evolutionarily it emerges it er, emerges from reptilians, Paton Leo. On top of the reptilian brain is the limbic system. The limbic system is, it has something to do with your emotion control. Why you feel particularly negative emotions. Why you feel fear. Why you feel sorrow. Beca it is because the activation of your limbic system. They are controlling emotions. It also has a nickname, mammalian brain, because evolutionarily it emerges from mammalians. On the top of your brain is your cerebrum, which is your cerebral cortex. That part of your brain is processing high mental function, like how you reason things, how you learn a language how you learn mathematics, how you learn ca calculus, how you learn to program, program. These are all controlled in this part, your cerebral cortex. So basically, these are three layers of your brain and the location from the first to the third is from the base to the top. Evolutionarily, it, this part em em emerges earlier and later and later. Okay. So this is the, the location of the uh, three parts of the brain. The purple part is your brainstem, which controls your basic physiology. On the top, this yellow part is the limbic system, okay, which controls your emotion. And this part, the outer part, is your cerebral cortex, which controls your high-level mental functions. Okay. In addition to different parts of the brain, you, for all, we actually have 
two brains for each person. The one is on the left and the other one is on the right. And why do we have two brains? And why does the left brain have to be separated from the right brain? The reason is because they have different functions. How are they different? So in the last hour, we just have had a very brief introduction of how our nervous system is divided. Okay. We've got central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And then, we, and then we shifted our focus on the central nervous system, particularly on the brain. Okay. In our brain, you can vaguely separate our, uh, separate our brain to three layers. The brainstem, the limbic system, and the cerebral cortex. In addition to that kind of division, you can also separate our brain into two parts, the left brain and the right brain. How do we know that they are separate? The knowledge of separate brains comes from a, gr a group of patients. They have, their problem is their left brain and their right brain are separate. They, they are called the split brain patients. Split brain. Okay. Their brain is split. Okay. Why do they get split brain? There could be many reasons. One of the major reasons why the two brains don't communicate within them is they suffer from epilepsy at the beginning. What is epilepsy? Epilepsy is a syndrome where their neurons are firing abnormally. So they could get some very weird, some uh, weird behavior. When they are sitting there, they may start to get some epilepsy syndromes, which is, could be quite hard to control. And one of the treatment to cure epilepsy is to cut down the connection between the two brains. So after the surgery, their right brain and their left brain are separate. And after they got separate brains, if you ask them to do things separately, they will get something weird. For example, in this, ca in this case, if you want them, in this task, you show them appear on the left hemisphere. Because for our right brain, our right brain controls the left part of our body. And our left brain controls the right part of our body. Okay. But for vision, vision is something tricky. We have two eyes, the left eye and the right eye. But remember, the separation of our vision is based on the visual field rather than the eye. Our left from your perspective, your left visual field is controlled, or the information from your left visual field is sent to your right brain. And your right visual field, the information from your right visual field is sent to your left brain. Okay. This is something you have to keep in mind. We have two eyes, left eye and the right eye. Your left eye has information from the right hemisphere, right visual field, and the left visual field. And your left eye also has information of your right visual field and your, your uh, left visual field. visual field. Both from your eyes, like the left visual field information from both of your eye is sent to your right hemisphere. And the information from the right hemisphere, right visual field, from both of the eye, is sent to your left hemisphere. Okay, so this is something counterintuitive, okay. but you have to remember. So, based on this left-right division, if you look at this patient, if you present the patient a pair on the left visual field, the pair will be sent to his right brain. Okay. If you ask the subjects to pick an object which is similar to what he sees here with his left arm, he can do it 
because the information from the left visual field is sent to the right brain, and the right brain is also controlling the left arm, so he can do it. He can pick up an object with his right, sorry, with his left arm, and that object is similar to what he sees in the left hemisphere. He can do it because they are both controlled by the right brain. But if you ask him to pick up an object presented on the left visual field with the right arm, he would have problems. He can't do it. If you look at this picture, he would pick up a wrong object. What is it? The reason is the information from the left visual field is sent to the right brain, and the right arm is controlled by the left brain, and they don't have any connection between the right brain and the left brain, so the information in the right brain can't be sent to the left brain, so he can't do this task. But for us. It's not hard for us because there are connections between our left brain and the right brain. But for him, he doesn't have this connection, so he can't do the task on the right. The left and the right thing is different from you know it's, it's opposite. The left right thing on the outside is opposite to the left right thing in, within your head. But basically, your right brain is controlling the left part of your body, and your left brain is controlling the right part of your body. In addition to this kind of difference, there is also another difference on their functions. Our left brain or left hemisphere. Is controlling our language. For most people, our language is controlled by, by our left brain. Remember, the Broca's area. That patient Dong, he got injury in his left front portion of the brain, and he had a difficulty pronouncing language properly because his injury was on the left part of the brain. But this kind of language local lateralization is not a hundred percent. There is a small, very small group of people whose language is lateralized to the right hemisphere. Okay, five percent, five percent of right-handers, their language is controlled in their right hemisphere. For left-handers, the figure is slightly more. Fifteen. Percent of left-handers, their language is controlled in their right hemisphere. But in general, for overall population, most people, our language is controlled in our left brain. And what does our right brain do? The data from the right brain is relatively mixed. It's not as clear as the data from the left brain. Okay. There seems to be a, a tendency that our right brain does something to do with special relationship. Anything special seems to be controlled in your right hemisphere. And also facial expression, judgment. How do you know someone is happy, someone is sad? How do you judge a person's expression? It has something to do with your right brain function. So so far, we have been focusing on the nervous system. We have been focusing on the brain in general. But if you really look at how the brain works, you have to know that the reason why the brain works is because there are a lot of neurons in our brain. So next, we are talking about how a neuron works. Neuron. This is 
how neuron, a neuron looks like. Basically, you can separate neuron into several different uh, structures. There are a lot of structures, but we just focus on two of them. Dendrite, which look like tree branches, and then axon, okay, which is focused on these two parts, dendrites and axon. In addition to the neuron, in our nervous system, there is another, there is another guy whose role is also very important. They are called glial cells. And what are they? Look at this picture. The middle part of the picture is the glial cell. And the, uh, the top is the, the, a neuron. The bottom also is also another neuron. And what does a glial cell do? Firstly, it guides newborn neurons to appropriate location. When a fetus or a baby, okay, before a baby was born, okay, when the nervous system was still forming its shape, how do those neurons know where to go? Okay. Because of glial cells, it will guide neurons to the place they have to be, they have to go. The second function of the glial cell is myelin sheath. They form myelin sheath. And what is myelin sheath? We're going to talk about the function of myelin sheath at the end of today's lecture. Okay. The other function is it makes up blood-brain barrier. What is blood-brain barrier? It's a specific structure in your brain. The blood vessels in our brain is actually, in a way, is thicker. Why does it have to be thicker? Because our brain is important. You can easily imagine that our brain is important. So there are some poisonous substance, substances in our body that can't go into your brain. So that's why the blood vessels in the brain, they have to be more protective. The walls are stronger, thicker, and that wall is called the blood-brain barrier. And what is the material of the blood-brain barrier? The material is this glass cells. Okay. Let's go back to the neuron. What is the function of a neuron? A neuron is important because it conveys information. How does a neuron convey information? Okay. It conveys information through two mechanisms. The first one, action potential. The second one, synaptic transmission. What are they? Let's begin with the action potential. Okay, today we are going to use a lot of a lot of biological knowledge in biology. Okay, today this week is special. In the next few weeks, it won't be as that biology as it seems today. Okay. For an action potential. We have to introduce th the two leading roles in action potential. The two leading roles are this one, sodium ion. Okay. It doesn't look uh, sodium at all, but you know, it's sodium. Sodium ion. This is potassium ion. Okay. Just there are just two things. Okay, you don't have to really know how they look like or their properties. Just remember, they are just two, just like two roles in the movie. Okay. Sodium ions and potassium ion. And in this picture, this black line here indicates the membrane or the wall of the neuron. Okay. The bottom part is inside of the wall, inside of the neuron. The top part is outside the wall or outside the neuron. And there are a lot of channels on the wall. Okay. When nothing happens, okay, when there is no stimulation, when there is no drama, nothing happens, there are more sodium ions on the outside of the neuron. There are more potassium ions inside of the neuron. The difference between the 
charges or the difference between the voltage is minus seven mini volt. It is just a number. Okay. Like there are more positive particles on the outside in comparison to the inside, and the difference between them is minus seventy. It is a magic number. When nothing happens, the voltage difference between the outside and the inside should be minus 70. Okay. The minus 70 millivolt is a magic number. It has a special name. The name is resting potential. By definition, resting means if when they are resting, <laughs> when nothing happens, so they are resting, the difference between the inside and the outside should be minus 70. The reason why we need the nervous system is to convey information. So of course, it won't be resting all the time. Sometimes there will be something happening. So if something happens for some reason, if, there is one, if one day there are some sodium ions coming from the left, they are just like messengers. Okay? These messengers come from the left. The consequence is, okay, they come from the left. They come from the left. So it increases the positive value of the inside of the wall. So originally it was minus 70. Because of them, it becomes minus 60, minus 59, minus 58, minus 57 and so on and so forth. When it reaches minus 50, another magic number. Okay. Some drama will happen. What is this drama? This drama is sodium channel opens. Okay. Sodium channel opens. When this voltage value becomes minus 55, the sodium channel will open. And the consequence of sodium channels opening is the sodium ions will come from the outside to the inside. So when there is one sodium ion coming from the outside, the voltage value will become probably minus 45. And another sodium ion comes, the voltage value will become something like minus 35 and so on and so forth, up to a point where the voltage value becomes positive 40. Then another drama will happen. The new drama is potassium channel opens and sodium channel closes. So now, potassium ion opens. The consequence is the potassium ion rushes out. Okay. And then the sodium ion closes. And potassium ion keeps rushes out. Okay. So the voltage value, originally it was 40, and it becomes negative again. To a point like minus 75 and then the potassium channel will close. So this is an action potential. Okay, let's rerun, replay this again. When nothing happens, basi basically when nothing happens, there will be more sodium channels on the outside, more potassium ch channels, more potassium ions on the inside. Okay. And the difference between them is se minus 70. And then there are two messengers coming from the left. The two messengers are sodium ions. So they come to this location. And so the voltage value will change from minus 70. Here is minus 70, then it becomes minus 55 because of them. When it hits minus 55, the first drama will happen. The first drama is sodium channel will open. The orange gate will open. And when it opens, the sodium ions coming will rush in from the outside. 
which makes the voted value even more positive. Okay, it will become from minus 55 to minus 45 to minus 35 to minus 25 up to p p plus plus 10 plus 20 plus 30 up to plus 40. When it becomes plus 40, another drama would happen. The second drama is the potassium channel will open and the sodium channel will close. So potassium ions rushes out. So the value will go down from 40 to 30 to, tw to 20 to 10 to 0, minus 10, minus 20, up to probably minus 75. And then the potassium channel will close. And that is the whole process of an action potential. So at the end, after the whole drama, there will be more sodium ions on the inside of neuron and more potassium ions on the outside of neuron. There, and then we need another process to push those excessive sodium ions out of the neuron and to pull those potassium ions back to the neuron to make it go back to the origin. So that's why we need another mechanism, another structure called sodium-potassium pump. And it will send the potassium ions into the neuron and send po sodium channels out of the neuron to make it go back to the or original status. This process needs energy. Okay? That's why when, you, when your neuron is firing, it, it needs energy. It needs oxygenated hemoglobin. So that, I that is the process of action potential. If you, if you plot, this is the time, and this is the voltage change. At the resting potential, I if nothing happens, it is minus 70. And if the two messengers come, it becomes minus 55. When it becomes minus 55, sodium channels will open and sodium ions will rush in. So the voltage value will become very, very positive, 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 up to a point when it reaches plus 40. Potassium channel will open and sodium channel will close. So the voltage value will come back to minus, come back to negative, up to may maybe minus 70 something. And then this potassium channel will close. And then the sodium potassium pump will exchange the ions inside and outside of the neuron, making it back to the resting potential minus 70. So the whole process is an action potential. The question is, why do we need an action potential? I mean, is it, it looks quite complicated. Why is it so complicated? Why do we need such a complicated, complicated process to convey neural information. The reason is, if you look at this picture, there are three sodium channels and three potassium channels. Let's assume that the information comes from the left. Okay. So originally, we just call it site A, site B, and site C. The, the action potential starts from site A. So in site A, the sodium channel opens, and there, there is an action potential, so the sodium ions will rush in. But those ions, they won't stay. They will just move around. Up when they hit site B, it will initiate another new action potential at site B. The sodium channel opens and action potential begins and the sodium ions come in. And those sodium ions, it won't stay. It will move around. When it hits the site C, it initiates a new action potential at site C. And so on and so forth. So originally, the action potential starts from the left, but because of those sodium ions, it will move to the right. 
So at the beginning, the information is on the left. At the end, the information will reach to the right end. So action potential on the left eventually causes action potential on the right side. If you can, and you can imagine here, it is, it is the cell body of the neuron. And this is the terminal of the neuron. So the information will be sent from the cell body to the terminal. This is how a neuron uses action potentials to convey information from one side of the neuron to the other side of the neuro neuron. Okay. Then, what happens when the action potential reaches the neuronal terminal? Action potential can be sent from one side of the neuron to the other side of the neuron. And then what happens after the information hits the end of the neuron? This, that is why we have to talk about another thing called synaptic transmission. What is synaptic transmission? Okay, this is a neuron A. So there is action potential coming from the cell body to the end. And when it hits the end, the structure between neuron A and neuron B, we call it a synapse. Synapse is the gap between two neurons. When the information hits the end, some other thing will happen. So imagine there is a neuron, neuron A, like this. And then there's a neuron B, like this. So here, action potential, action potential, action potential, action potential, action potential, action potential, and when it hits the end, the consequence of action poten potential hitting the end of the neuron is there are some vesicles. here and there are some you can imagine this or something like small packages within the packages there are a lot of chemical substances those chemical substances are neurotransmitters When the action potential hits the end, the vesicles, they will release those neurotransmitters. So that red neurotransmitter will be released and they are, they are kind of swim around in this synapse. And then on the other side of the synapse, which is the neuron B, there are a lot of channels on neuron B. Okay. And then these neurotransmitters, they are just like keys. And these channels, they are just like a doors. A key will, oh, can unlock a door. So these neurons, when they bind a particular channel and it, be, it is just like a key opens a door so the door open if the door is open for positive particles in for example sodium if, if, if this this gate if this channel is open for a positive particles those sodium ions they will rush into neuron B and then they will move around, move around, move around, move around when they hit the axon then it will initiate another new action potential of neuron B so this is how 
neurons convey information from one neuron to the other. Okay, this action, this is action potential, and this process, neurotransmitters acting like keys, opening up a channel. This process is called synaptic transmission. In this case, in these examples, this gate is open for positive particles. But if, if this gate is open for negative particles, if it is not sodium, if it is n uh, open for negative particles, the consequence is those negative particles will reach the exon and it would decrease the likelihood of action potential on the other neurons. So that's why it could be excitatory or inhibitory. When those neurotransmitters, when they bind with the receptors on neuron B, if the consequence of binding is to let more positive neurons, positive particles to come in, it is excitatory. If the consequence is to induce more m negative particles to come in, it is inhibitory. So yes, this is neurotransmitter. It is just like a key. And it will bind with the gate. And it will open up the gate. And the consequence is, whenever the gate is open, the ions from the outside can rush in. If those, par if those ions are positive ions, it is excitatory. If those ions are negative ions, and it is inhibitory. So that is synaptic transmission. OK, so we are done with how a neuron conveys information. Basically, through two mechanisms. The first one is action potential, which is the way neurons to uses to convey information from its head to its tail. And then when the information hits the tail, hits the, the other end of the neuron, it becomes synaptic transmission to convey information from neuron A to neuron B. The next thing is myelin sheath. Okay. What is myelin sheath? It, this, this term doesn't look very user-friendly. It's really hard to remember and also very hard to pronounce as well. What is myelin sheath? Myelin sheath are structures that cover the axons. You, you, here, you, as you can see from here, these blue purple things, they are just like a train carriages covering the axon. They are called myelin sheath. And what is its function? Its function is to speed up signal transmission. How does it speed up neurotransmission? Okay. So when there is no myelin sheath, there are some neurons, they, do, they don't have myelin sheath. And there are some other neurons, they do have myelin sheath. For those neurons, they, wi without myelin sheath, if they want to convey information from site A, site B, and site C, the way they convey information is originally there is just action potential at site A, action potential. And those sodium ions come in. And then it will initiate the action potential at site B. The channel opens action potential, and the ions come in, and so on and so forth. This is how neuron conveys information in a, without money sheath. But if If they have myelin sheath, let's just assume the gray silver thing is myelin sheath. Firstly, at site A, there is an action potential, and the sodium neuron, the sodium ions come in. When it comes to site B, because of this myelin sheath, it doesn't initiate an action potential. It is not until the sodium ion hits site B that it initiates a new action potential at site B. 
So without money shift, the information has to come has to be transmitted from set A to set B to set C to set E, F, G, H, I, and so on and so forth. But if you have money sheath, the information can be conveyed from set A, and then you can jump to set C, and then you can jump to, to set E, and so on and so forth. So the whole process will be quicker. So that is why and how many sheath can speed up neuron transmission. And actually, there are some recent studies that suggest many sheath, although it could speed up the neur neural transmission, it has negative effect. The negative effect is because you can imagine that w when the neuron is covered with many sheet, actually it doesn't connect to other neurons that much. Okay. If you compare the situation where a neuron is covered with myelin sheet and a neuron that is not covered with the myelin sheet, the one without the myelin sheet, it, can, it, it will be easier for this naked neuron to be connected to another neuron. Okay. And for our learning, what is learning? One form of learning is your neurons are forming new connections. Originally, neuron A and neuron B, there is no connection. But because of learning, neuron A starts to get connection with neuron B. But you can imagine if you have mining sheath, the mining sheath actually it decreases the likelihood of neuron A connecting with neuron B. So although mining sheath can somehow speed up your neuron transmission process, but somehow it decreases the likelihood of learning or forming new technique or new, new knowledge. Okay. So probably that is also one of the reasons that, for example, when you are learning a new language, for some reason it's just easier for babies, easier for kids, harder for adults. Probably because for babies, for kids, their brain are relatively, the, their neurons are re relatively more naked, not covered with money sheep. So they can form new connections more easily. But for an adult, because their brain is mu mu mature, which means that their brain is not naked, their neurons are not that naked as a kid's. So it's, although they can process information probably more quickly, but probably the cost is it's harder for them to, new, to learn new skills. Okay. This is just one of the theories to explain why, like, particularly for learning a new language, it's, it's just harder for an adult okay, than a, a kid. Okay, so let's go back to the first slide. I showed today. This is how things begin. What do psychologists do? Psychologists are looking at human behavior. And we are trying to find out what causes those human behavior. And something that you, we can't de deny is we need, a hard, we need the hardware. Okay? We need a nervous system to implement the human behavior. And that hardware is our nervous system, it, which includes the nervous system, the neurotransmitters, and endocrine systems. This connection is easier, relatively easier to be found. But this is not the whole picture. We still don't know what causes those neural activities. It could be the genes. It could be the, the environment, or heaven knows whether free will exists. This connection is relatively harder to solve. Although it is harder, the connection is harder to be established, people still want to try to find whether there is any clue to establish the connection. Okay. So if we focus on this genes, environment, and your nervous system, 
Basically, our behavior has to be implemented by our nervous system. So of you can just simply imagine there is another circle saying behavior on the top of the neuro, uh, neural system. Okay. Of course, your genes, our genes, affect our nervous system. So this connection is easier to understand. What about environment? Just as what I said, when you are learning a new skill, actually you are forming new neuronal connections. So your learning, your experience, your environment can somehow modify, shape your nervous system. So this connection is, okay, relatively easier to understand. What about this connection, genes and the environment? How does your genes affect the environment? You can imagine that temperament, some people they are more extroverted, some people they are more introverted. For extroverted people, okay, probably extroversion is determined by your genes. Your genes decide whether you are a, an extroverted or introverted person, if you are an extroverted person, of course, you will tend to choose the environment where you can interact with other people. So your genes affect your temperament. And your temperament affects what kind of environment you want to be involved. So that is how genes affect the environment. What about environment and genes? How does the environment affect your genes? You know that for human DNA, we have a lot of large number of large amount of information in our DNA, but not every gene is ex expressed out. There are some genes, they are just they are there, but they are not expressed. And what controls which genes to be expressed, which genes to be not expressed? The environment could be a factor. Some genes, they are only expressed in some kinds of environment. And some genes, they are expressed in some other environment. So the environment can somehow affect our genes. So genes, environment, and nervous system, you can find mutual reciprocal relationship relationship between any combination of the three of them so that's why okay free will we don't really know whether free will exists so i haven't put the free will into this picture the free will will even make it even more complicated okay. in the next few weeks we are going to cover some topics about for example intelligence or sexual orientation, or something like schizophrenia, psychological disorders. When we are talking about those issues, we will touch a bit about this. Genes, environment, or in the nervous system. For example, intelligence. Genes and envir environment, which one is more important? Okay, this is also one of the assignment topic you can choose. Actually, this debate it's really very, um, it hasn't been resolved yet. And it is very hard to be resolved. The reason is, it's really hard for us to separate genes and environment apart. For example, if you can imagine a situation, if you want to talk about food, for example, food. When you are eating food, the flavor is important and what is flavor when we when you are talking when we are talking about flavor flavor it includes the smell the smell of the food is important also it includes the taste so smell and taste they are both flavor of the food if I want you to describe taste or smell which one is more important to determine how delicious a food is it is hard. The reason is the taste will affect the smell, and the smell will affect the taste. So you can't separate them. Just like here, 
because genes will affect environment and environment will affect genes. So it's really hard, technically, it's really hard to separate the two apart. So that's why in the next few weeks, when we talk about intelligence, homosexuality, psychological disorders, when we touch those topics, when we touch the topic of whether genes or environment, which one is more important, you can always find many different kinds of conclusion, many different kinds of data, and they might suggest con contradictory results. Part of the reason is because it's really hard to separate genes and environment. Thank <laughs> you.